Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sandra Bass, uh, and I do want to extend my thanks to Shizue too. So, uh, you know, to be able to share a stage with artists, I am an academic, <laughs> so I'm kind of like, you know, sliding in, trying something new. And I was, when I was speaking to Shizue, she's been so wonderful about um, helping me think about new voices. So, really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I grew up in suburbs of San Jose. I've spent the last decade living in San Francisco, and I work at UC Berkeley. And my job is really, it's an amazing blessing to have this job, is I work with um, our next generation of social justice leaders. And so this last year, as you can imagine, it's been interesting over in Berkeley. Um, I have physically been in the middle of a lot of the things that have happened, both our building but also my physical body. And so the piece that I wrote, I'm going to do read a condensed version, is called What Grows in Our Garden. Bay Area black folks are all too familiar with a type of nimbyism that lives in progressive places. This parochialism rests in the dogged belief that our region has somehow escaped the isms that plague the rest of the country. Over the years, friends, colleagues, even random strangers have assured me that discrimination does not exist in fill in the city, the organization, or the industry. That my experiences of bias or disrespect were isolated events or misunderstandings on my part. And that we, really me, were fortunate to live in a place that embraced difference and where moving up in life came to those who had earned it. Racism, not here, not in our backyard. Then the 2016 presidential race took us all down the rabbit hole into this country, country's foundational hatreds and landed squarely in the Bay Area. That the Bay Area is not, in fact, a post-racial paradise came to light when Trump's campaign stopped in San Jose, inciting a street malay between his supporters and opponents. Then within weeks of the election, student Republicans at UC Berkeley decided to test the university's free speech policy by inviting hard-right pundits to speak on campus. So here's what's true. Despite the extensive media coverage, the motley mix of white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and Proud Boys in Berkeley, and other extremist rallies around the country were vastly outnumbered by opposing protesters at every turn. What is also true, many of the right extremists were homegrown Californians. White nationalism is on the rise throughout the state and hate crimes, just one measure of the growth of this movement, were up in several major cities last year. In this beautiful place, with its beautiful people, a strange and bitter crop is unfurling its twisted leaves under the welcoming heat emanating from the White House. Yet despite this extremism, my hope is not waned. What looks like new growth is more likely the last desperate attempts of an old and dying order. And besides, authentic hope is not untempered optimism or a belief in a preordained happy ending, but a practice that grows in strength as we rise up together to right wrongs and cultivate new realities. I see this in my work every day with Cal students. Planted in their hearts are the possibilities for co-creating a society centered on radical inclusiveness, systemic transformation, and communal responsibility. And so we are faced with a choice Will we continue to deny the existence of old yet persistent injustices? We will, allow, will we allow this current fury to sustain itself on alienation and fear? Or will we act to ensure that what grows in our garden is what we love? Let's till the soil with our collective imaginations, nourish seeds of change, and bolster fledgling shoots with ageless wisdoms, compassion, and courage. Not because we're certain of a quick harvest, but because it's through daily acts of loving and serving with and for each other that we grow into our boundless sacred humanity. Constant gardeners we must be, ever preparing the earth and ourselves for rich and abundant life. Thank you. <laughs>